Welcome, I'm Lori Lee Binstock, and this is a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast. Thank you for joining us for a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast now on Mental Health News Radio Network. This podcast is also available wherever you get your podcasts, but I do suggest checking out Mental Health News Radio Network to find all your podcasts related to mental health. Today's guest is Cindy Benezra. Cindy is the author of Under the Orange Blossoms. She is a speaker, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and sexual abuse survivor and advocate who is passionate about bringing awareness to the impact of sexual trauma through meaningful conversations and system-changing discussions. Cindy, thank you so much for joining me today. So good to be here, Laura Lee. Seriously. I would love it if, if you would be okay with sharing your, your personal story and how you got to this place of being this advocate. So when I was younger, um, I was abused by my father from the age of five to 10 mm. and um, sexually abused. And my abuse looks slightly different than others. I mean, we all have our own story and my dad fondled me, but he kind of groomed me into that role. I didn't know what was truly happening until later on. And my dad focused more on pornography. He took pictures of me and it's interesting. I find that a lot of people don't feel that pornography, child pornography is a form of sexual abuse, but, but it is, it's, it's definitely a, a form of child abuse and um, it's kind of epidemic. It's all over now that we have the internet, it's all over the place. And that's usually how a lot of pedophiles or um, people find a lot of, I guess you could say um, they're searching for children who are un- unclothed or are staged And um, I was one of those kids and it took a lifetime. Seriously, I'm 60 now and it has taken me a lifetime to go through all of that. It stopped at 10. And the reason why it stopped at 10 is because my dad was not no longer attracted to me since I had uh, developed early. And um, so then I was just of no interest to him at all. And he had abused other people in the neighborhood sexually abuse them too. So in in definition, he really is a pedophile. Um, later on in life, um, when I was trying to find some resolution, I mean, I was still in my 50s trying to find resolution for my dad. I would ask him all the time, why did you do these things? Mm. And deny them. And um, when he started talking and he was in his 80s, he admitted for the first time that he did do those things. And I started to interview him and do a lot of audio. And then I do have um, one footage and it's on my um, YouTube channel, um, what he finds attractive in young children. And I said, you know what, dad, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write a book about our life and maybe somebody will find some healing in this form, maybe either um, some realization of, maybe a mindset of a pedophile, or maybe it would be um, what my, I mean, it's my story and we all go through our own stories, but it was my story of what I had gone through. And I found it interesting that a lot of people wish that their um, perpetrator would have apologized. And I think that was kind of like my greatest epiphany in this whole thing was what does that apology look like and what would we do with that apology? And um, that was uh, in that process, I realized I never really got the apology. It wasn't what I wanted to hear. And that was the magic in the work through this whole process. And no matter how much therapy I had, I think I was waiting for an apology and I never got that. And then to come to terms that, okay, I didn't get the apology that I wanted to, and I didn't get those years back and I didn't get I still had anger. And what I realized is that a lot of times um, we hold the key to our own grief and our own anger. And that was my greatest epiphany that it's, it's a process in life. If we want to hold on to what parts of, of our, what parts of our grief do we want to hold on to and why? And when we let go, what 
is that the healing that we want to receive? But it took me years to figure this out. Wow. I, I was also sexually abused by my father. And I feel like it's a whole different situation. And I, I want to ask, did, did you tell anybody? I did. Him? I told close friends. But, you know, you know, coming from survivor to survivor, you know, when you do tell friends, it's you're, you're always weighing, are they trustworthy? Will they keep my secret? Will they share with others? Will they shame me? You know, it, so I think it's always like, you're just worried about that. And then you do it in different stages. And I already remember um, dating and thinking like, well, okay, so do I tell this person, you know, what's their reaction going to be? And that was a really hard one for me too. So I did tell people along the way, but it wasn't like, um, I think it was always safe and it never really came up until uh, probably in my fifties when I started, I sat around, I was on vacation with some girlfriends and I said, we were all sharing something about ourselves and I did share with them, but it wasn't like I made an announcement to a group of girls. And in that announcement, I said, you know, I was sharing my, a little portion of my life. And that was when they said, oh my gosh, I never thought that you had ever gone through any trauma or you ever had anything hard in your life. And I was kind of blown away. Like, oh my goodness, my life has been challenge after challenge after challenge, you know, only when I could take on the challenges. So that was sort of like, I thought, gosh, that's just crazy how we could all put on different masks just to go through life. And mm. how we just don't really sometimes see each other and why we react certain ways or certain triggers will hit. And I'll tell a friend and go, okay, this kind of stuff just freaks me out. So I just got to share with you, this happened to me in my past. So I got to tell you, if I ever become this way, will you just like, hold on to me or just stand here? Don't leave me, you know, that kind of thing mm -hmm. so it was just, um, yeah, just crazy process. And that wasn't until later on. And that's part of the reason I do this is because I realize people go, oh, well, like, what does somebody look like who's gone through any form of abuse? What do we look like? Um, I remember asking my kids, what does a pedophile look like? Or what does somebody who sexually molests other people? And my kids were like, they live under a bridge. I mean, these are, my kids are in their thirties now, but um, they were in their twenties. They, they live under a bridge, you know, their home. Mm. Uh, no, honey. It's, and that's kind of like in the process, I'm sort of like, well, it's your grandfather. And that really blew them. Like, oh my goodness. I go, they look like anybody. How and old were your kids when you, when you, them? yeah. Um, I have to say they were all different ages. So, um, I had one dot, so I have four kids, one daughter, she was 14 because she kept on insisting, why won't I have my grand, her grandfather over and why can't she go into the bedroom with her grandfather to show her, her, I don't know, some toy or something mm -hmm. she kept on asking over and over again. And I, I thought, okay, I have to tell her. So, um, and then after that, I think it was trying to help her find boundaries with her grandfather. So when he would come over, I would only have him sit at the dinner table and we would have a meal together and he was allowed to go to the bathroom. And I know people say, well, why would you even do that? But for me, it was really important um, I couldn't, it was harder for me to cut him out of my life and pretend that he didn't exist. Then I just couldn't do that. For some reason, it was just too much work for me. So I did what was right for me. Right. And, and um, my other daughter, she was in her twenties. I just felt that she wasn't able to emotionally, I think it was just overwhelming for her. So I had to wait into her twenties and I really had to um, work through it. And it's interesting. She's a therapist now. Mm -hmm. And um, my son, I have a special needs son. And I found it interesting when I told him, you know, what had happened to me and all the cause and effect of what happened from that time, all the way into adulthood with friendships and learning disabilities. You know, um, I, I was, um, I had suicide ideation, I contemplated suicide. Um, so when I shared a lot of this with him, and he has special needs, he goes, wow, mom, 
I relate to you so much more because I really thought that your life was just like perfect. But now I recognize that you struggled and struggle just as much as me. And I've never felt closer to you. So then I just, oh. wow. and then my oldest son, he still can't talk to me to this day. And he about this, and it's interesting, he's a politician, and he still can't, just can't talk about this. He knows about it, but he just can't talk about it. I just find it fascinating that, you know, when you do share your, with your children, or if you choose to, that it is something that you probably have to take into consideration, like what, where they are emotionally and how they could process information. And I think only a parent would know that. I think um, mm -hmm. you would just, you have to kind of guide that. And that's even if you really want to or even have the person in your life. Wow. How was your relationship with your, with your dad after the abuse? Um, we were always, I used to say this to friends because they would ask like, how come you're not close to your dad? That's always the hard part. Mm -hmm. to have Abuse. Like, how come you're not close to your dad? Um, I would always say, well, we're, um, gosh, what was it? Oil and vinegar. We're fire and beauty, <laughs> but mm -hmm. we really were. So I wasn't lying. Um, and I, or I would just say, you know, we just have a, a strange relationship and I don't really care for the person who he is. And when they would meet him, they would kind of go, yeah, he is kind of weird, but you know, that's just a friend <laughs> being mm -hmm. a friend and just kind of like standing up for you and sticking, you know, kind of like hearing you. But that's what I would say, um, because it was the truth. And um, not until later on in life, when we really, when he was real and honest, could I even have true conversations with him? And I felt, I felt that he was, um, he really put himself out because he hid it his whole life and didn't want anybody to know, but he felt that it was time to talk about it. Mm. And I don't know. Um, my son said that maybe he was, he knew he was going to pass, that he was trying to find some retribution. That's the way my son looked at it. Uh, my daughter, uh, the one that I work with, she was like, well, maybe he saw how important it was finally to you at the end that you needed some resolution before he goes. And I thought, well, that's a different way to look at it too. So who knows what the real answer is or where he was going but I think he struggled in sharing a lot of his, his truth. And when I heard it, and as I was interviewing, I have to say most of the time I wanted to vomit. Like I felt mm. really ill in hearing his truth, um, his, what he was attracted to, why he thought that way. And I realized like how mentally ill, how disturbed he was. And, um, just being human, I felt like how trapped he was in the mindset of a pedophile, but like disgusted, <sighs> like just disgusted. And it didn't make it better for me. It still doesn't make it better for me. It doesn't make it right. Um, I think that's what also I realized about uh, the process of forgiveness for yourself when you go through this. It didn't take away my shame. Um, and that was a big process where I just thought like, you know, how do I work on giving him this shame? This is not mine to own. How do I work on giving him the shame, you know, where he owns that? And I talked to him a little bit about that. I said, I don't know why I'm holding your shame. I mean, this is, this is, this is not what I need to do. And so I think that was sort of like an empowerment movement in myself and kind of like in my soul, like taking back ownership of, of, of self a little bit. Mm, wow. You know, I, I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and I talked about this a little bit in a previous podcast, but um, this person who was on my panel said, look at your parents as your grandparents, children and see it's, it's how they are raised and what happened to them and how that kind of got passed down uh for for me i um i actually did i did a, a mdma assisted therapy which i thought was where my breakthrough happened where i 
was able to see my father in as a child in in you know I'm Filipino and I saw him in the Philippines as a child and he was abused by his family like by his father and so when I saw that I that 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 anger lifted and I was able to be more compassionate like oh my gosh this is ha- this happened to you you didn't know any better because for the longest time I was like he knew better he had to have known better he told me not to tell anybody right um but when I realized like when I saw that like th- those that that was where his mind was like you're saying his your 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 father's mind was trapped in the head and like the mindset of a pedophile it it I wonder if he told you what had happened to him. Did he ever say anything? He did. So um, he was born and raised during the war and in Germany, and he was raped by soldiers Mm. as a, as a child. He didn't really go into great length about it. It was very confusing. He would have like Sometimes I felt like he was playing um, with my emotions because I am a compassionate person. Mm. So I felt like he was telling me things. I never really knew where his truths were because he does have a mindset of, 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 um, mm, of manipulating. Mm, and yeah. Narcissist. So it's, I've always used caution. So it's, um, I I never really knew what the exact truth was. So I took everything with a grain of salt, but I did hear it. And I thought, well, that's horrible. And that's unfortunate. Um, But let me just say it this way. And this is how I told my dad, I said, okay, dad. So look, like this happened to me. Would I do this and give this to my child? You know, um, like this was horrible. It, it like shaped my world. Would I choose to do this to my children? Absolutely not, because I know it was horrible. So why would you choose to do this to me? And he didn't really have he's this is the twisted part he was he didn't really have a a true answer for that he goes well that is just the way of the world that is just what happens that is just part of of how you raise children and I just thought oh my Mm, god yeah and he has to rationalize his reality to make him feel better and I I did tell him that and um then he would pause and he would listen but um, I said, that's how you could sleep at night because you've rationalized your truth. And I said, well, I, I said, I'm a truth seeker and I could never rationalize and cause pain to somebody else. And I also feel that cycles have to be broken. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, I don't know. I feel like, I don't know how often this has happened in our family. I haven't heard any stories, but I do believe that cycle should be broken. And um, we are in an age now that we have resources where like you and I could communicate right now and yeah. hopefully we could break these cycles. And I think when you talk about these things and just any part of it, I feel every time I do, I feel that cellularly, there's a change in our bodies that we could heal. And it's, it's not just what we say verbally. It's, it's really like in the structure of our body. And it's that, that book. Um, uh, oh gosh. Uh, see the, the body, body, the body it, keeps the score. It keeps the score. Exactly. And when I read that, I thought, yes, because I would almost feel it like every single time if I would have an epiphany, it was like, oh, uh aha. And I felt like it was one more step close to my empowerment or getting back what I thought that I lost, but it was a different kind of feeling and just being rooted in my body. It was something that I couldn't even articulate. It, it was just different in myself. Wow. You know, from when you, when the the abuse happened and, you know, a lot of people go through PTSD and certain symptoms where they're just, they medicate, they self-medicate, they, you know, there's something that, you know, like 
I, I believe it or not, and it's very weird to say is that, you know, I, I mean, I really just went down a rabbit hole of just like bad behavior. And I, you know, my parents would always say, my mom would be like, oh, you're, you're just a bad teenager. You're a bad kid. And, and I thought I was, you know, she, they t- kept telling me this, but I realized 20 years later that it was all a symptom of the abuse and, you know, I, you know, I was promiscuous, I did drugs and I drank and I did all these things. And I didn't realize that until just recently, right? Like three years ago. <laughs> um, what was it like for you? What was the impact of this abuse for you? Um, so oh, crazy. And I know a lot of people have experienced this too. It's called dissociation. Mm. And so um, I had this happen to me. And so at 10, then I went through puberty and um, it was like my mind shut down and I didn't recall one thing that had happened to me. All I know is I didn't like my dad and um, mm. so from 10 all the way to 16, when I was just started like, oh, boys are kind of cute. And um, I just started having my, my first sexual encounter, like at six, it was close to 17, 16, 17 there. Um, until after that, um, did I go through a complete flashback? It was like my brain wow. opened up and I started having horrific, horrific nightmares. And, um, it was like I was experiencing them all, but I didn't understand why I was dreaming about these things. And it was so vivid. I would wake up completely in a sweat. I would scream. And every night, I mean, I didn't want to sleep alone. So they were night terrors. And I lived in a foreign country. I happened to live in Spain at the time. So we didn't, I, I mean, I didn't speak Spanish. Um, there wasn't a local library when I mean, the internet didn't exist way back in that day. So I didn't really have anybody to consult or talk to. And when I talked to about this, my mom, like I'm having these nightmares, she seemed concerned, but she never really dug deep into it. Mm-hmm. And, um, I would like, sometimes I'm like, please mom, can I sleep with you? Because I'm just having these nightmares and it went on. So, but basically I started journaling and writing down these dreams because they were just haunting. And every time I have a dream, I just get up and then I'd write, write. And when I had my, I looked through everything, I could put the piece the times together, kind of going like, it's, it was like um, a shattered window or a mirror and it had been broken in a thousand different pieces and through this journaling I was able to put my timeline like of what happened to me as a kid and when I recognized that it was me because I used to think like this cannot be me this is just too horrific because my dad was physically abusive emotionally abusive and he he was very very manipulative And um, when I put this all together, I realized it was my life. And when I realized this, I talked to my mom, my dad, and I said, hey, dad, you know, did you ever, and I said touch, because I didn't even know the right word to say, it just felt creepy. I said, Mm. you ever touch me? And he's like, no, why would you even say that? And oh my gosh, like what's going on with you? And why would you do this? And then the other thing was like, maybe you read it in a book, maybe you saw it in a movie. And I thought, oh, deflection. I mean, I could see this all now. And then it was, oh, are you okay? Are you like, like I was crazy or something. And I thought, I remember looking across the table at his big blue eyes and thinking, oh my gosh, you are lying. You know, this is the truth. This is the truth. And then I went to my mom and my mom was like, oh my goodness, why would you start this up? You know, why would you start talking about these things? And I thought, what is my mom hiding? And she was like, everything's going so well in my relationship with your dad. And why are you going on? I just thought, oh my gosh, what is going on? And in that, I fell into the deepest, deepest depression where I would come home every day from school and I lived in Spain. And so it's a little bit different there, but I would sit outside my window seal and think about jumping every day. 
and mm. what were Gosh. the pros and cons of life? Like why, like I couldn't deal with this horrible, dirty secret. And I couldn't have taken enough showers or baths to get the smell off of my body or the, just my mind felt heavy. And in that process, I really thought about taking my own life. And when I look back at that time, I think like, thank God, you know, because I would have missed out in so much life um, about trying to figure out like, should I stay or should I go? You know, like what is the beautiful parts of life? Because I could find nothing. I hated everything about myself and I hated my life. It was just overwhelming. And from there at 16, it became a healing process. Like, how do I find love for myself? How do I like myself again? And how do I, so I kind of turned to drugs and alcohol, but mine was a story of like, how do I find myself back into this mm. world? And yeah. I think I worked on every day because I didn't have the tools to go to a library. Like, how do I stay present in my body every day? and want to get up the next day and I think that's what became almost slightly obsessive like how do I do this like how do I find and look at the sky again when is it blue like you know I would I could not even relate to the color blue or I could not relate to anything beautiful I I remember trying to focus one thing about my face that I liked and I remember I liked my front teeth and my eyebrows <laughs> but I'm 16 and I was really trying to hang on to finding something beautiful about myself because I loathe myself. I mean, anybody who wants to take their life really is trapped. They're, they're just there's no other way. They're just trapped. And um, until you find a way through that, sometimes it's just minute by minute or day by day. Wow. Yes. I do think that that is that, that, trapped is the word I used when I felt very suicidal was I felt like there was nowhere else to go except to take my own life. And that was, and that, that is a really hard thing. But the fact that you were able to even recognize that you needed to find yourself and that you needed to figure out what it is that you loved about yourself. Like I'm still working on that, but at, at, at this age of 16, the fact that you were, you were working on that, that just, that blows my mind that you ha were had that self-awareness and that mindfulness to know that that's what you needed to get you through. Well, it's not like I didn't have a few drinks here and there. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely, so Spain doesn't have a, a drinking um, age. You could drink. It doesn't really matter. But I realized that just made me feel worse. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and that wasn't the way. And I just felt like if I did something for my body, um, that felt better. So it was like, do you have a drink? That didn't make me feel better. It just made me feel sadder. And if I walked or if I ran, then that made me feel better. So I think it was, and I didn't have any influences around me. I didn't see anything. So it was just going by my intuition. I, I just, I just kind of cut everybody out and it was just going by my intuition. So I, that's sort of why I'm kind of a firm believer that we have these tools inside of ourselves if we really do a lot of deep soul searching we have the uh, and they're not um they're not fancy memberships to go someplace i mean they're really like we're born with these tools mm -hmm. to help ourselves it's either it's a lot of work and either we we do it in stages and if we choose to do that yeah yeah that's that's I, 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 I absolutely believe it. Some, some people like myself, I needed a little bit more help in finding those tools with it. But once I did, it was like, the sky's the, li the limit on my healing. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, no, I'm, I'm curious. You said that you thought your mom knew something. Mm -hmm. Did she? So, so at the age of, hold on. It was seven when I told my mom, seven, eight, I told my mom, I said, dad comes into my room and touches me. And, um, oh, okay, I'm gonna start all over. So mm -hmm. um, I was seven, eight, and my dad took a photo of me. It was, um, 
it was me naked under the Christmas tree on a fur rug, like, you know, like a pinup girl and we had presents around me and I was posing and different things. And my dad was so thrilled with this. Um, I liked doing the pictures um, instead of all the other sexual stuff that my dad wanted me to do because I found it just to be easier. It was just, it, it like if it was anything kind of like sexual with my father, it was always based on fear. This was just smiling, not smiling, posing, that kind of thing. And it didn't involve anything with my, it just didn't feel dirty, I guess you could say. And my dad used different words. It was all manipulation. But he did say, um, this is going to be our Christmas card. I took it for face value. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> our family Christmas. I mean, it tells you how naive I am. Um, oh, wow. So I'm like, oh, this is going to be our family Christmas picture. Okay, cool. I'm seven years old. And um, I, I um, told my mom, you know, that this happened to me, that dad was coming into my room and touching me. And, and I said, oh, and look, mom, uh, well, she was asking more questions. And then I said, well, he takes pictures of me. And then I went and showed her the picture of me underneath the Christmas tree. And she looked like she had seen a ghost and she's like, are there more of these? And then I pulled out this big box and showed her all these pictures of me. And, um, I think that's when I told my mom, my mom, um, left my dad. She left him several times. They usually say it takes four times to leave an abuser, but, um, it wasn't that happened, did not happen on the fourth time when I showed her this and we went to a kind of like a woman's shelter. And even at mm. that seventies, there wasn't a woman's shelter. There was just a shelter that happened to have more women in it. And so we went into, a, they didn't even have a sex kit then. And um, what happened is that um, since they didn't have a sex kit, um, I had bruises. I didn't have broken bones. I had my hymen intact. Um, so they put me back into the home and my dad said that he would never do it again to my mother. So my mother moved back. And it's also part of our culture. A lot of times these things happen a little bit more in certain cultures. Um, yeah. So um, it was, my mom went back and she believed my father and she also felt that she couldn't work and hold a job and that he was a good man is what she would say. And I mean, he did treat her fairly well. I mean, he did, what she valued was having a roof over her head and, um, uh, that he treated us well, but that was to her, what she saw. But I remember saying as a kid, mom, I would live on the streets. I would take my kids out. I would take my kids out of this. I would never even put my, up with this. Mm -hmm. Um, You could find a job. You're so much better than him. You're gorgeous. You could marry anybody. You don't have to even marry anybody. You could do anything. And I remember thinking that. And then she, when she would go back time and time again, it was just, the most disappointing thing as a kid. And I'm sure that impacted me in some ways too, where I just thought, you know what, I would never do this to my kids. I would live, you know, I would just never do this to my kids. But it was um, a conversation I had later on with my mom and it took a lot to get over it. And um, I don't think she really saw what I was really going through as a kid. And I realized that my mom had been sexually abused too. So mm. You know, yeah. a lot of these cycles and we rationalize a lot of the behavior. And um, so I understood her a little bit more, but it doesn't make it right. And right. I'm telling her that, and I'm sure that was very hurtful for her to hear. It doesn't make it right. Yeah. Wow. Well, you are quite the cycle breaker. That seems like a lot where that you just stopped right at you. Like there's nothing, nothing coming from your dad's side of the family and your, um, your mom's side where you're like, this is, this is not how it's going to be with my children. And so that is, that is such a brave step. And I don't think a lot of people understand how difficult that is. You have to do a lot of relearning. Oh gosh. Well, it's not only the relearning. I think it's the cycles in the family, because when you do share something like this, that. 
um, this happened in my family. It's not like you just get out and go, hey, mom <laughs> abused me. You know, right. <laughs> everybody, yeah, I told you. Now let's go on with life. I mean, it is like a nuclear explosion in families. And those that want, I mean, what do you do? Like, I remember my mom saying, I know it sounds crazy. What are we going to do for the holidays? I was like, oh man, like I'm in a different, <laughs> like, really? That's where you're at? And I was <laughs> Oh, wow. Like, um, what are your, what's the family going to say? We're a good family. And I just remember thinking, you know, like, okay, these are the consequences. And what about siblings? You know, how do they, you know, it, you, they, it might've happened to them. And you're also telling, this is your story and you have to keep it to your story. And you Mm -hmm. had that sibling out. And I just realized it was way more complicated with the family. And a lot of times I hear that people get alienated from their families because they did break a a secret. They did break, you know, what stays in the household, you know, what happens behind these walls stays here. So um, that is to me, I found that to be in some ways more difficult because there was, I wasn't just dealing with myself. I was dealing with lots of other family members. And if you have a culturally tight family where there's aunts and uncles and cousins, you know, then that is, that's, that's the challenge. And I think often um, that's what keeps us quiet is because of that dynamic. Yeah. I do think that um, incestuous sexual abuse can feel more damaging because like you said, we have to get there. There's this there's a secret that the family just wants to keep with them themselves. You know, I think if someone else came in, like, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure 95%, I think that's the between 90 to 95% of people who are abused are sexually abused by someone they know. Mm-hmm. And then, but you know, then there's, and and I think we don't realize how prevalent it is. Cause like you said earlier, you know, when you're, when you ask your children, you know, what do you think a pedophile looks like? And they were like, oh, it's a person under the bridge. It's someone who's just living on the street. And that is, that is quite the opposite. And I think we need to really bring that conversation, you know, to, to the forefront, like, no, it is, it is the people around us. And so we need to be more vigilant and we need to stop forcing children from hugging their, you know, like, you know, I, I know growing up, it was like, hug your uncle, hug your aunt, you know? And it was like, now they're telling, you no, like, let your child make that decision for themselves. And, and, and so that's something that I think people are just, just trying to grasp and work on now. Right. I think, you know, um, that was something I even did, you know, when I look back at my kids, I would say, oh, hug, you know, hug your grandfather. And I was just thinking like, how creepy is that? You know, just knowing where I came from. And then later on, I would just say, well, say goodbye, (laughs) say goodbye, you know, like, obviously, like normal responses. And I thought, oh, they don't have to hug him if they don't want to. And I would just say, say goodbye. You know, that's normal. You say goodbye, hello and goodbye to people. So Mm -hmm. um, I think it is just different ways of parenting now. And um, it's just something that we have to be aware of, you know, in this generation, they're probably listening to this thinking like, of course, you guys, like, of course, why would you force your children to hug somebody? But it's also too, I think in the Hispanic culture, it's very, you always show respect for your family and you hug and there's a lot of physical touch in there too. So how do you keep that, um, those boundaries and then respect yourself and respect, you know, your children show your children, like, if you don't want to, then you don't have to, but right. yeah. yeah. Well, um, Cindy, is there anything else that you would like to add Oh my goodness, Laura Lee. I could just, seriously, I could talk about this for like a week. On I, end. <laughs> I do enjoy talking to you. I would, I would really, I feel like this episode could go on for hours with everything, just my personal like curiosity and interest in, oh my gosh, that happened to me too. But how did you respond? You know, I'm, it's, I feel like we could do this and, and, you know, and I, I appreciate all the, the information that you're providing to this audience. Cause I think it's, it's powerful, but I, but I do want to know, like, is there anything that 
you feel like this audience needs to know um, to help themselves, to help everyone else, to break down any type of stigma, anything? Well, share this episode, you know, but I do want to say to those who have walked a similar path as we have, that there is hope. And I do know, I really do know this, that if you are searching for healing, that it takes time and there's no magic wand or bullet, um, that it's a, it's a time thing. And even if you go to two therapists, it, it's your mind and your body could only handle so much in certain stages. So be kind to yourself and, recognize that it's a process. And if it takes, you know, years and years, just hang on because there is more beauty and more freedom into coming and growing through this process at the end. So hang, you know, hang in there. And there's lots of people who have gone through and find healthy relationships and find themselves all over again. And actually, in some ways I've come out richer and fuller, um, in emotion and digging so deep. Um, so there is, um, light at the end of the tunnel. Wow. Yes, there is. And thank you so much, Cindy. I really appreciate you joining me and sharing your story because I feel like it's an important story to tell because, you know, every time I've told my story, a lot of people have come out and said, you know, that that something similar has happened. And so now I feel comfortable talking to my therapist about it when they went through therapy for so long without even talking about what had actually happened. And so it's stories like yours that help other people get the healing that they need. Thank you. And the same with you. You know, if you um ever feel like reaching out, you know, I'm here. I'm at uh, www.cindytalks.com. I have a blog. I um, would love to hear hear from you. I have a, um, also my book coming out in Spanish. It's in English too. And that's under the orange blossoms. But um, I'm also on Instagram and the social media. But it really what I care about is you and letting you know that you are not alone. And um, as Laura Lee, she's like the most beautiful example of how, how survivors do come out and um, they live, we live beautiful lives and you will too. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. That was Cindy Benezra, author of Under the Orange Blossoms. For more information on Cindy and to purchase her book, check out the show notes. January's issue of Authentic Insider is out. Check out Authentic Insider at traumasurvivorthriver.com. That's traumasurvivorthriver.com. And you can also check out past episodes of a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my email list to get Authentic Insider in your inbox monthly. We will be back next week when I speak with Dr. Victoria Johnson when we discuss how she survived abuse, became a trophy wife, to then become a surgeon. You've been listening to a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast. I'm Lori Lee Benstock. Thank you so much for being a part of the conversation. Take care.